encounter. So we've been looking at these really pivotal encounters with Jesus in the first 11 chapters of John's gospel. We're starting a new sermon series next week as we kind of slow down through John, going through the season in the church calendar called Lent. Uh, And Uh, We're going to be really slowing down and looking at John chapter 17. It's called Jesus' High Priestly Prayer. We're going to be doing that like three verses at a time for the next six weeks. And so it's going to be super powerful uh, as we continue in John. I wanted to just also give a shout out to uh, our ministry center venue going on right now. So uh, we launched this in December. It's going really well. wanted to kind of invite you into maybe checking it out. Obviously, hopefully not right now, uh, but maybe next week uh, or the week after. It's going on in our ministry center right now and uh, wanted to, yeah, again, promo that. It's uh, widely accepted that Steve Jobs, uh, co-founder of Apple, uh, definitely one of the most influential uh, figures in the last 100 years. People figure since 2007 in the introduction of the iPhone that 2.3 billion iPhones have been sold in the world. 2.3 billion. I mean, you have one probably right now in your pocket or in your hand. There is a biography of Steve Jobs by a guy named Walter Isaacson. And in this biography, He catches and reports on Steve Jobs grappling with the idea of his coming death. Uh, Jobs tragically and sadly died at the age of 56 from pancreatic cancer. And so Isaacson kind of gets into uh, Steve Jobs' reflections on his coming death being obviously uh, riddled with cancer. And so here here is what Jobs says. Uh, I'm about 50-50 on believing in God. For most of my life, I felt that there must be more to our existence than what meets the eye. And so Jobs right now is in uh, his backyard, in his garden. He's thinking about uh, 40 years before this moment, really kind of investigating uh, more Eastern spirituality, reincarnation, Buddhism. And he says, I'm 50-50 in believing in God. He admitted, though, that there's probably a bias inside of him, thinking about the existential threat of his own death, uh, that there's probably a bias within him that he wants something to be true after his death. And so he says this, I'd like to think that something survives after you die. It's strange to think that you accumulate all this experience and maybe a little wisdom, and it just goes away. So I really want to believe that something survives, that maybe your consciousness endures. And so this is somebody grappling with this about what is it going to be like when my heart stops and this is my next reality. And so he says that maybe, maybe, I'm 50-50 on God, but maybe something does survive. He then, as reported by his biographer, he fell silent for some time. Then he says this, but on the other hand, perhaps it's like an on-off switch. Click, and you're gone. Maybe there is nothing. And then he starts to smile and says, maybe that's why I never like to put on-off switches on Apple devices. See what he's saying? He he, he doesn't want it to be true that like you turn off your phone, that his life is just going to be turned off, and then there's nothing coming afterwards. This is Jobs dealing with the thing that we're all going to have to deal with at some point, and it is sadly our death. How do you view these moments in your life. And for some of us, it's closer than others. We don't know, but here we are. We're gonna see an encounter that Jesus has with two grieving sisters on the death of their brother and Jesus interacting with these two women in very different ways. And then we're gonna come out of this because guys, this is a short sermon this weekend because we have way too many baptisms and this is a problem we want every single week. It's amazing, yeah. So I want to bring you to the text right away. We're going to see Encountering Martha and Encountering Mary in John chapter 11. Here is what it says. On his arrival, on his arrival, the the chapter starts with these two sisters, Martha and Mary, sending for Jesus, who is about two miles away, saying, hey, my brother, who you love, is sick, and we need you here ASAP. That's how this is gone. Jesus then talks about his love for Martha and, excuse me, and Mary, and for Lazarus. And he's hinting at, in this text before this, he's hinting that all of this will be radically turned around, and all of this moment, however sad it is, is actually going to be glorifying to God in Lazarus's uh, being called out of the tomb. 
But on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus has been already dead for four days. As we've been seeing in John, details matter. We're going to come back to that. Now, Bethany was less than how many miles? Two. Also, this matters. From Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. These are the two sisters that we are introduced to, Martha and Mary. We're also introduced to Martha and Mary in Luke's gospel of the famous story when Jesus is there and Martha is the busybody and Mary's just loving Jesus' presence, right? These are these two sisters and we see their personalities in the way that they're grieving the death of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. She is active in her grief. She wants to be with Jesus. She heard that he is there, but Mary stayed home. We're going to look at that in a second. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. What a statement. In other words, where were you? Where were you? Going back to the details. The Jewish belief was that the the soul would linger over the body for three days after death. Day four, departed. What John is saying to us is that he is dead, 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 dead. There's no hope. That's what he's saying, okay? Not only that, but Bethany was less than how many miles? There's two. John is building the anticipation of, Mary's, of Martha's question. You were right there. Where were you? In my grief. You could have, and you didn't. How many of us in this room have asked that of God in some of the worst moments? Where were you when this happened? Why weren't you? Where were you? Why did you show up for them and not me? Why now? These are the questions that we face when some of the worst things happen, this is what we would call a complaint to God. And I think, I think what I first want to say is, we're allowed to do this. For some of oh no, God, no, you can't do that. Actually, no, we can bring our complaints, our where are you's to God. Like all the way through the Psalms, you have these beautiful moments where the psalmist is crying out, where have you been? How long, oh Lord? And so this is what we see happening in Martha, where is God in life's worst moments? The perceived injustice of it all is what she's grappling with. So I don't, I mean, there's things obviously that we could share about this, but as I was grappling with this question, um, I, I want to be appropriate in what I share. Uh, my, a, a person extremely close to me was diagnosed with a life-altering terminal illness last summer. Not a family member, but extremely close to me. It had an influential impact on my life. And I went into complaint mode with God for like two months. If anybody deserves a great retirement, it's him. And yet, this is it. Like just this week, somebody distant in my past was again diagnosed with a terminal life-altering thing. And so I think, like, in those moments, I'm like, well, God, why are you so hidden in this moment? And this is Martha. And this is probably you in some moment. And so how do we deal with this? This is the most difficult problem in all of human experience to resolve. The problem of evil and suffering. And so whether it's Christianity, whether it's agnosticism, whether it's Buddhism, whether whatever worldview that you want to adhere to, this is the most difficult question you could ever ask. It's the question, the most difficult question philosophers, thinkers have been trying to grapple with. Why is there good and why is there evil and how does this all work? We do not have time as we have so many baptisms this this weekend to dive into this. But what I will simply say is this. Christianity is the only only, uh, idea or the only worldview, the only person that you can work through this thing with hope, with purpose, and with meaning. And that you are allowed to ask this question because, in fact, it's a question that Jesus asked himself on the cross as he was dying. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
my sense is that you probably aren't gonna get easy pat answers to the most difficult problem that you have experienced. You're not going to get that from anywhere. But what you will get with, with in Christianity is Jesus saying, my God, where are you in this? This difficulty is followed up right away from Martha, but saying, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. So her, her depth of despair is followed up very quickly, but hold on, hold on, you're here now. Maybe something can change, and so it goes on. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. He meets her in her grief with a theological truth. Your brother's gonna rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Here you are brought into the dominant view of first century Jews' idea of the resurrection. At the end of all things, that's when the resurrection's gonna happen. That's what she believes. Nobody within Judaism thought that somebody in the middle of history would rise again. They thought resurrection was only at the end. So you may disbelieve in the resurrection of Jesus because of science. Let me just tell you, the Jews had no paradigm to believe that somebody would resurrect in the middle of history, not at the end. They had just as much reason to disbelieve in the resurrection as you do today, but on different grounds. Theirs being religious, yours probably being science. But here is what Jesus says to her. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, what you think is going to happen at the end of history is going to happen today. The hope that you have in the future, I am rewinding that and bringing that today because I hold the keys to hell, death, and Hades itself. Jesus brings the hope that Mary, Martha had in the future now to the present. He says, don't look anywhere else but to me. I am the one who resides and is sovereign over these things. I am the resurrection and the life. See, to Martha's depth of despair, what Jesus does is he gives her theology. I am the resurrection and the life. It's beautiful. He tells Martha, lift your head. There's good news because I am here and circumstances can change. He tells her to lift her head. This is Jesus encountering Martha. Then he says, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who came into the world. And so now in her grief, the kind of theology lesson now is done. Hey, Martha, lift your head. There's good news. Okay? But he continues as he encounters Mary. After she had said this, she went back and called her, uh, her sister Mary aside. So she has this encounter with Jesus, comes back, Mary now is sitting there. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. This is a personal invite. As Martha is leaving, Jesus tells her, hey, send Mary. I, I have something for her too. When Mary heard this, she got up Quickly, my friends, if you're to do kind of a nerdy word study about this in the original language, this very phrase here is the very same phrase that the New Testament writers speak about Jesus' resurrection. She got up quickly. See, Mary, unlike Martha, did not run out. Mary is at home. She is resting. She is sad, lonely, and depressed. See, her grief takes on this debilitating reality that she's not even able to get out of bed he's gone and she's left to make sense of life without the brother who she loves and it's in this place in this place of grief where Jesus calls her name he's going to call Lazarus's name in a few minutes but he's gonna call Mary's name and call her unto himself and she got up quickly you see we Spoiler alert is that Lazarus is going to be called out of the grave. But he, here's the thing. <laughs> Sorry. I, I hope, maybe you didn't know that. You're like, oh, man. <laughs> here's the thing. There, there's actually two people being called out here. And it's, the other one is Mary. That's the, that's the thing in the text that people don't see. That Mary's being called out of her depression and her loneliness and her uh, uh, depression out of this. And went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met them. He hasn't moved. When the, when the Jews who had been there, uh, been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb 
to mourn there. It was customary that um, they, they would enter in what's called Shiva. It was a, a, a week of mourning. Okay, and so there would be people who would just be weeping and wailing along with the family. So this is the kind of the crowd. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. This is what grief does to people. She couldn't get out of her bed, but she fell at the feet of Jesus and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The exact same thing that Mary, Martha said. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Where were you? That's what she's saying. But notice she doesn't follow this up with a but. That's all she can muster. She doesn't have this underlying belief, this maybe stronger resilience that Martha had. But I know, but I know. No, she doesn't even, she can't even get that out. All she says is, where were you? How does Jesus encounter her? It's, it's not through a theology lesson. This is what happens. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled because he saw what death does to the human race. He entered into their wailing. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And this is the verse that all of you can memorize this morning. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. To Martha, lift your head. I am the resurrection and the life. To Mary, no, no, no. She doesn't need it. She doesn't need that. She just needs somebody to be with her and cry. He wept. What a beautiful image. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying. Even the crowd says, hold on a second, this doesn't compute. So here's a few reflections. This morning, Jesus meets you where you are. This text gives us beautiful insight, amazing insight about what God's like. Don't you see to Martha, oh, Martha, 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 there is good news. Wait, I am the resurrection and the life. And to Mary, he sheds tears. What is God like? Truthful, sovereign, life in himself. I am the resurrection. And gentle and tearful, and emotionally present. Who is this God? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. You will never find a moment in the Gospels where you read it and think, he should have done more. No. He's perfect. You will never find better. He knows exactly what you need. In the moment you need it, because for some this morning, you need to hear, I am the resurrection life. Lift your head. And for some, you don't need that. You need somebody to be present with you in your grief, in your loss, and your disappointments. And he will weep with you. Remember who he is. He dignifies both of them. He sets both of them right, but in their own ways. Second reflection, Jesus called dead things to become alive. Because here, here's how it ends. John 11, Jesus once more deeply moved. This actually, in the original, is the word bellow or yelling. Okay? Um, the, the commentators will say, uh, Jesus here is kind of roaring like a lion. It's this deep from the most core part of the human being, this bellowing at death, okay? He's, he's yelling, some commentators say. So w Jesus once more bellowing and yelling at the pain of death. And if you've been in any funeral, that's what happens at death. We bellow and we yell and we wail. Why, 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 why? He came to the tomb. It was a cave with the stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. 
But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for, again, four days. This is going running through the text. Like, no, 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 no. He's starting to decompose. Don't do it. That's disgusting. In other words, like, why are you, bring, why are you making this more difficult on us? We already know that he's dead. Stop. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? This is before our text. Because all of this moment, see, Jesus isn't just emotionally playing with these people like puppets and strings. No, no, no. He's not doing that. What he is doing is he's using this moment as a forecaster of what is to come. Because somebody else will be in the tomb and somebody else will come out. So all of this, he's saying, actually, this is going to be good news for Lazarus, but I'm telling you, there's better news. Because it's not just Lazarus who will die again, but I, in my resurrection, will never die again. That all of this is setting up the pieces and the places to see Jesus' conquering of death itself. So they took away the stone, and then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you have always heard me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, bellowing again. You see this. He's bellowing at death. He's yelling because of the emotions that he sees and how humanity has been affected by death and sin. And then with the same type of thing, he yells and he says, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This, my friends, is the best news that you could have this morning. It's the best news. Because Jesus, encountering Martha on the resurrection, encountering Mary with weeping, he then goes to the tomb and calls out this dead man unto life. Jesus can and does call people to life again. And if you have your faith and your trust in Jesus, this is your reality. This is your reality now and forever deeply moved, he comes into your life and he's calling, he still is calling people out of the grave into new life, into things that they never thought possible before, experiences that they had, addictions that have crippled, family systems that have destroyed, he's calling people out. The grave of discouragement, the grave of depression, the grave of addiction, the grave that you find yourself in today, Jesus has the authority to call into it and say, come out and come into life, and the grave's clothes fall off. And my friends, this is the hope of Christianity, is that we just firmly believe that there is no life, there is no life, there is no soul, there is nobody too far gone. Because Lazarus was in the tomb for four days and he became alive again. And Jesus can do the same for you. And so what we're going to do 